So now I have the distinct honor of introducing our first keynote speaker, MIT Professor Emeritus Rodney Brooks, a trailblazer in the world of robotics and artificial intelligence. Rod is a revered figure in our field. His contributions have profoundly altered the landscape of how we think about robots and AI, how we interact with technology, and importantly, how we envision a future alongside it. Rodney Brooks is not just an academic. He is a pioneer who has founded several influential companies. His entrepreneurial spirit led him to create iRobot, famous for its Zumba vacuum cleaners, Rethink Robotics, which brought revolutionary changes to industrial automation with Baxter and Sawyer robots. And most recently, his venture, Robust AI, aims to usher in an era of more capable general purpose machines. Rod's journey reminds us of a fundamental truth, often overlooked, that the heart of scientific inquiry lies not just in a quest for knowledge, but in a deep-seated desire to make our world a better place. From his groundbreaking research at MIT to his entrepreneurial ventures, Rod has embodied this truth. His career is marked by many prestigious awards, including membership in the National Academy of Engineering and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the IEEE Founders, Founders Medal, Medal uh, the Computers and Thought Award, the NEC Computers and Communication Prize, and the Robotics Industries Association's um, Engelberger Robotics Award. Engelberger Robotics Award. So please join me in welcoming a visionary whose work continues to inspire and challenge our understanding of intelligent machines, Professor Rodney Brooks. Hello, and thank you so much for uh, uh, people inviting me here. I, I am not a generative AI person by any means, but I want to talk about generative AI today. Um, a lot of people see generative AI bringing, you know, mana uh, to, to the world, new things, new, new, new prosperity, etc. But I'm going to concentrate on the mantra, what it tells us about us, and what are the deep scientific questions. Now, there's a a variety of people here, <coughs> so I feel it. Uh, I, I need to set a baseline and talk a little bit about what is in large language models and, and generative AI. There'll be more about that later this afternoon or later this morning. <coughs> um, so <coughs> if you don't know the technical background, I'm going to just give a little piece of it. And I would suggest the minimal reading you should do is not the stuff under Stephen Wolfram's left arm, but the stuff in his right hand, this little pamphlet. It's 80 pages long. It started out as a blog post back in February, um, and it gives a good overview. Second thing I, I really strongly recommend, um, if you don't know the technical background, is the GPT-4 technical report from OpenAI. Open AI. It's about 100 pages. The first half of it um, talks about GPT-4, what it can do, um, performance on various benchmarks. And the second half is called the system card, where OpenAI goes into what can go wrong, what it can't do, um, how to jailbreak it, et cetera. It's a very interesting report. Now, you might ask, should we believe Stephen Wolfram, on, who has a, a company, Mathematica, on what, how ChatGPT works? Um, has anyone here, here, here heard of Sam Altman, does that name ring a bell <laughs> to anyone? This is what Sam says on the back of this little brochure. Um, this is the best explanation of what chat GPT is doing that I've seen, so it's the truth. If you go to the website, the, the blog, the, the diagrams are in color, and this is the start of the blog, it's from February 14th of this year. What does chat GPT do? Chat GPT do and how does it work? It's just adding one word at a time. This is uh, more from talking. The remarkable thing is that when chat GPT does something, like write an essay, um, it's essentially doing is just adding, asking over and over again, given the text so far, what should the next word be? And each time it adds a word. Here's a, 
Here's a diagram from Murray Shanahan's recent paper in Nature. Time is going from the left to the right here. It's the same LLM. There's an input, a question, which sets a context. Write me a fairy tale. And once ChatGPT is, is written once upon, the LLM, the large language model, looks at that and says, ah, ah, once upon ah. Step over to the middle, once upon a, what's the next word? What should it be? Time, once upon a time. Blank again, L looks at what it's written so far. Written once upon a time, what's the next word? What should it be? There, once upon a time there, etc. And the, the point here is, you know, if we were writing a fairy tale, we'd think of the whole phrase. Once upon a time, there was a king or a dragon or something. Um, but it doesn't think that way. It's just one word after another in the context of what it's already generated. And it randomizes what the next word should be a little bit, because otherwise it gets really boring. I asked ChatGPT 3.5 to write an abstract for this talk. And what did it do? It said, title. I didn't ask it for a title, but the context of a, a, an abstract for to a talk in the style of an MIT nerd, I asked it. Um, and it produced this abstract, which is not so bad. It's the sort of thing you should talk about if you're talking about generative AI. Uh, did it get the nerd part? I'm not so sure. Look at that last sentence. Um, where is it? Um, join us for a concise and insightful journey into the realm of generative AI. That sounds more like a National Geographic trailer. It's not a MIT nerd talk. So I didn't get it all right. But it generated it pretty well and has a lot of the issues that Daniela mentioned that we're going to talk about in the next three days. And I'm going to talk about three different versions of ChatGPT, 2, 3.5, and 4. There's many other LLMs, large language models from other companies but I'll refer to these three in particular. How do they work? This is the, from the, the paper, Attention is All You Need from 2017 from DeepMind, a Google company, and it's the block diagram of how these large language models work. On the left, the question goes in, some input, some processing happens, that gets injected into the middle of the thing on the right. The thing on the right is the generator, the generative AI that generates the words. On the bottom of that is the output so far, which keeps getting shifted as a new word gets added. And it flows through those boxes, gets some probabilities at the top of um, what sort of words should come out, what's the likely next word. One gets chosen, shift, do it again. And what's in those boxes? Well, those boxes are a very s simple sort of computation and a special sort of computation. As Jan LeCun likes to point out, there is no iteration here. These just flow through boxes. It's like you've got a network, you set the inputs, and the output just flows out. There is no computation, iteration, recursion going on. It's a simple flow through network. And it's made of neuron models. Now, neurons are what's in our brains, what's in worms' brains, and the neuron model that is used really started from a paper by um, McCulloch and Pitts back in 1943. They later came to MIT, the Research Lab for Electronics, and then modified by Frank Rosenblatt in the 50s. Now you might notice no one knew much about neuroscience back in the 40s and 50s. So this is a model from the 40s and 50s of the brain. That's what this is based on. And what do the simple neurons look like? Well, there's some numbers, they're just numbers, that come in as inputs, you know, sort of like the inputs to a neuron going through the synapses. There's weights, this is the jth neuron in the big network, that's what the subscripts J are. There's weights, W1, W2, Wn. These are what gets, these numbers, these weights, get adjusted during learning. I'm not gonna talk about how the learning happens, but that's where the knowledge of the network is. And there's 175 billion of them in chat GPT 3.5. The weights get multiplied by those anonymous numbers that are the inputs, summed together, that's the net input, net J, and then it goes through a transfer function to, to, to produce a zero or a one, or a minus one or a one, 
The top one is what was used in the 50s. It got modified, getting rid of the threshold, and now it's a continuous uh, function, uh, logistics function. An important thing about that is it's differentiable, so it can be used for back propagation in learning, which I'm not going to talk about anymore. But there's just some numbers go in, the weights, and another number comes out at the end. And that's what those boxes are, just a whole bunch of those, 175 billion weights. And it works surprisingly well. Uh, th these people from a recent paper from Alison Gopnik's lab at Berkeley, she's a psychologist. She studies children. She has children come in and test them and gets them to do all sorts of things with language, with perception, et cetera. And she and her team say, oh, by the way, I saw Alison about three weeks ago, and I said, did you really mean what you said here? And she said, because I, I, I don't want to quote you if you didn't really mean it. And she said, yes, I really meant it. And they say large language models such as ChatGPT are valuable cultural technologies. They can imitate millions of human writers, et cetera, et cetera. So she's very positive about ChatGPT, and she studies children. But then they say, ultimately, machines may need more than large-scale language and images to match the achievements of every human child. She says, they're good, they're, they're a, a valuable cultural technology, but they're not as good as children. And this is a, a familiar theme. The green stuff, people think they can do, the red stuff, not so much. So that's uh, uh, Gopnik's lab. She also distinguish, distinguishes between transmission versus truth. Uh, Ye Jin Choi, uh, she was at CSEL, beginning of the month, and she gave a talk on, she's a natural language processing person from University of Washington, and she talked about generation, good at generation, not so good at understanding. Melanie Mitchell, who's at uh, Santa Fe Institute, she talks about memorization, they're good at that, not so good at reasoning. Yan LeCun, a Turing uh, Prize winner, uh, along with Jeff Hinton and Joshua Benjo for deep learning, which is the learning technique which is used in these systems. He says he's good at reacting, not so good at planning. He sort of, and he, he, he alludes to system one versus system two from Daniel Kahneman in making that distinction. So what it can do, what it cannot do. There's a lot of people making that distinction. Uh, but I think Subaru Kanban, Kanban Party, it says it in the, in the most interesting way. Uh, Subaru, Subaru is a, a professor at uh, Arizona State. He was until recently the president of AAAI, the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, the premier academic uh, professional society for AI. And he compares LLMs to alchemy. Now, alchemy, you might remember from about 400 years ago, was how do you transmute metals, how do you transmute lead into gold? Ah, that sounds really silly, but you know, you may have heard of Isaac Newton. You know, he came up with gravity, he came up with optics, um, oh, he developed calculus along with Leibniz, and he was master of the mint, producing all the coins of Britain, but he spent over half his life working on alchemy. It was not a fringe science then. And what Subaru says is they thought chemistry could do it all. But it turns out they didn't know about nuclear physics. That was really important. And he says it all sort of in a cynical way there. You know, if you prompt it just right, the chemistry might be nuclear physics. Um, but <clears throat> they didn't know about nuclear physics, and nuclear physics is what you need to transmute lead into gold. Theoretically, it's still not cheap to do it. It's not cheap enough to do it. Nuclear physics, the technology is not well enough controlled. And he says, well, the problem with LLMs might not be much different. There's something else for true intelligence. So what can it do, what can it not do? I'm gonna look at a slightly orthogonal question. Exploration versus exploitation. And as Daniela pointed out, the next two days are gonna be how we exploit this vault, valuable cultural technology in useful ways. And I'm gonna talk about exploration. What does its existence mean versus what can we make it do, this generative AI and large language models. And first I want to start with three scientific cultural observations. Now, everyone who worked in AI 
um, last century, into the beginning of this century, in every AI course, uh, learnt about a bunch of things which I think LLMs challenge. What we, what we all learnt has changed somewhat. And these three things are, the Turing test has evaporated, thank God. Searle's Chinese room showed up, uninvited, and there's some questions for Chomsky's universal grammar. I'm going to talk about each of these in, in, in one after the other. Turing test. This is from Alan Turing's paper in 1950. He didn't call it the Turing test, he called it the imitation game. Um, the paper was computational machinery. And he said, what if a person is texting either another person or a computer? He didn't say texting, he said using a teleprinter, but the equivalent today is texting. What if they, they, some person is texting one of those two? Can they figure out whether it's a person or a computer? Um, and this was a rhetorical device he was using. He starts out in the beginning of the paper as a rhetorical device, because he wanted to get away from the question of defining thinking or defining intelligence. But his point was, if a person can't tell the difference between a computer and another person that they're talking to, then surely you have to admit the computer's intelligent, as intelligent as a person, because he can't distinguish. That was his argument. He, um, this, this got, this test, or this, this question, got adapted by the press. The press gets involved in technology, by the way. You may have noticed that. It says stuff, and then we believe it. We listen to it. So he, the, the press has used the Turing test for 70 years as the ultimate arbiter of whether artificial intelligence system is intelligent or not. Turing said in 1950 that he believed mach machines would be capable of uh, fooling people 70% of the time by the year 2000, and that the program would consist of two billion bits. He, he really you know, stuck a, a, a stake in the ground about how complex it would be. And up until two years ago, the press was still talking about the Turing test, the Turing test, the Turing test. But you may have noticed the press doesn't talk about whether LLMs pass the Turing test or not. It's sort of assumed. And this is a, a little piece from Nature from a few months ago, saying ChatGPT broke the Turing test. Um, no longer is it, is it does this program uh, pass the Turing test or not? Can it fool you? No, it's, it's, not, it's not a fine enough question. And it turns out, I think, that we're more interested in what it can say rather than the fact that it does say. The Turing test was about it saying intelligent stuff, but now we're much more interested in what it can say and what level of intelligence that is. Second thing that in AI we all learned about for a long time was Searle's Chinese room. John Searle, the philosopher at Berkeley, 1980, came up with the Chinese room. Why the Chinese room? It was because English speakers back in 1980 pretty much universally didn't know Chinese at all, so it was a, a separate language. And he could talk about a person knowing English versus a person knowing Chinese, very different sorts of things. Oh, so I asked ChatGPT 3.5 to explain Searle's Chinese room. This is what it told me. Uh, imagine a person who doesn't understand the Chinese language locked inside a room. They have a set of instructions written in English that tells them how to manipulate Chinese symbols, the, the characters in a, in a question in Chinese, and they're input through a slot into the room. They have no understanding of Chinese and don't know the meanings of those symbols, the, the Chinese words, the characters. From the outside, someone passes messages written in Chinese through the slot. The person inside the room follows the instructions of the program and produces responses in Chinese just based on symbol manipulation. And then most importantly, or, uh, and to an observer outside the room, it may appear Searle says that the person inside understands Chinese, but no, they're just manipulating symbols. And here I, I emphasize the last thing the chat GPT 3.5 said, which is very important, without grasping the semantics or meaning of those symbols. So the idea is the person outside writes a question in Chinese, puts it under the door, the person inside has big books of rules written in English, look at this symbol, if it matches that, do this, do that, and they output an answer is, does the person understand Chinese? Does the room understand Chinese? This was the philosophical question. 
I, so I typed some Chinese to chat ChatGPT 3.5. I didn't tell it I was going to type ch Chinese. I don't know Chinese. I use Google Translate. It produced the symbols for me. Um, who is A Weiwei, a, a Chinese artist? And it came right back in Chinese and told me who he is. Um, it's the Chinese room. It's there. This was this philosophical thing that we talked about for years, and it was imaginary. It couldn't be real, but now it's real. How does that chat GPT impact various arguments that people have had for decades in AI about symbols and grounding? Uh, my personal old argument, which I don't think works anymore, is without grounding words, tokens, or symbols, and visual motor stuff, the instructions would have to be impossibly large. So it's a stupid experiment. It, you know, it's an imaginary experiment, uh, you know, thinking about it this way. But here we have this Chinese room, which is 175 billion weight, 32 bits each. That's less than a terabyte. Everyone's laptop in this room can store a terabyte. It's not that large anymore, and it does it. Wow, what does that mean for us? We thought there was something more about grounding. And some, sort, some people thought that language was too strongly grounded in non-language, so the language-only solution couldn't possibly work. I used to talk about an example with Korean rather than Chinese on this also. But no, there's no grounding in stuff in the world for these uh, LLMs. All they have been exposed to is billions of pages from the web or, or uh, uh, from books. Just, they just read stuff. And, and they can answer in Chinese, they can answer in any language. And some thought that clearly it was the room and the person together that understood Chinese, not just the person. And that Searle was sort of making a, a, a category mistake in, in, in saying, well, if they don't understand Chinese, it's the whole system. So would Searle now say that ChatGPT understands Chinese or not? Or does it just look like it does? And I think based on some arguments we had, where I said, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck and smells like a buck, duck and poops like a duck, it's a duck. And he said, no, 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 not unless it's a biological duck. Only then. So there's a sort of an animism. But I think it brings some questions to us. What does it mean to be intelligent? Now I'm going to just take a sidetrack and explain a little bit more about how ChatGPT works before I come back to the third one. Because this is important. I've talked about grounding. What does a symbol mean? And how ChatGPT works, at least I'll just use the English part, is the words are just numbered, about 50,000 in English, either words or parts of words. So cat, dog, chair, run, bark, pre, ing, eyes, etc. 50,000 of them. That's the first step of processing, which is not done with a neural network. It breaks it into tokens. And each of these tokens, whether it be English or Chinese or whatever, is assigned some meaningless number. Let's suppose it happens to be one, two, three, four, five, six for these tokens above. Then inputs, when I type a question, they're encoded as a string of numbers. So if I say dog running, dog, that's number two word, run is number four word, ing is number seven piece, dog running is two, four, seven. Dog barking would be two, five, seven. So these meaningless numbers, there's no relationship between these numbers, just a sign. And then, through looking at lots and lots of text, the correlations between these numbers start to mean something. And they, what are called, they start with what are called embeddings. With a special piece of learning at the start, the correlations between these tokens get learnt as a vector. And in the case of GPT-2, the vector consists of 768 neurons. And the output of those 768 neurons are numbers between 0 and 1. Um, they're drawn here for cat, for dog, for chair. In chat, chat GDP 3.5, it's 12,288 numbers rather than 768. They're both of the form 3 times 2 to the n. Chat GPT 4 is probably way larger. We don't know what it is. It hasn't been uh, talked about publicly. These embeddings as a vector are what represent the tokens going through the network. And 
when you look at the structure, you know, a vector, you know, you could have a two-dimensional vector, an x-coordinate, a y-coordinate, then you could have a z-coordinate, then you have 768 coordinates. But if you look at them from a particular direction, the points change their relationship from those vectors. And here Wolfram to chat GPT-2 just projects one particular direction into two dimensions, and you see there's some associations which start to make sense. It's almost a grounding, an understanding of what's there. So duck and chicken are close together, dog and cat are close together, alligator and crocodile are really close together because no one ever writes about them knows the difference between them, so those words always are interchangeable. Um, over in the fruit area, you know, um, apricot and peach, they're sort of similar. Uh, papaya is closer to a melon. So there is some meaning there, there's some grounding, but it's all being just extracted from language. It's not through our sensors, senses that we use. Okay, so the grounding of symbols is replaced by embeddings of tokens, but it just comes from correlations of text. That's what we sort of need to understand to understand how the Chinese room works at all. Let's look at the third thing, Chomsky's universal grammar. Developed in the 60s, the, the, the X-Bar paper was 1970, I think. Uh, here at MIT, linguistics department, was the, was the center of this. And the idea is that humans, children, have some machinery in their head which is, is able to represent all the grammars of all the languages, all the human languages. And when children are exposed to that language, hearing it, it sets some parameters in their head about what the language is like, whether it's um, you know, got cases in the nouns, for instance, or not, um, whether how, how tenses work in verbs, and there's different parameters that get set. And that's why babies are able to learn language, because they have this genetic machinery that's dedicated to language. Ooh, ChatGPT didn't have that universal grammar anywhere in it. It appears to have acquired lots of human languages without the universal grammar constraint mechanism, nor reference semantics. Ah, oh, that's a bit of a problem, I think. Um, it either means we have to modify universal grammar, or we have to say, eh, you didn't get that quite right. Dangerous thing to do near the linguistics department here at MIT, I can, I can assure you. Um, but it is acquired in the sense of grammaticality and coherent use. Is it just because that's a vastly bigger training set than, than, than human babies? The amount of stuff ChatGPT read to get trained is way bigger than any human could ever read or know about. Is its transformer mechanism, that stuff on the right, is that so, somehow a, a superset of universal grammar? Does it implement it in some way? These are, I, I think these are deep scientific questions. And it seems to be a pr promiscuous language learner. Um, is it capable of a bigger class of language than humans? And if so, what constraints are there on what sort of languages it could learn? And Chomsky posits that only one species exists with true language, us humans. You know, um, gorillas don't have language, chimpanzees don't have language, whales couldn't possibly have language, because language is this universal grammar. But here we've got this system learning language without the universal grammar. It's a, it's a, it's a scientific conundrum. So these valuable cultural artifacts, large language models, have, you know, caused us to have to rethink a bunch of things that we thought were settled for the last 50 years. They're not. Now there's a deeper question. Where is the power coming from? And I don't know. I'm gonna suggest one example of where it might be coming from, but there's 200 or 1,000 other examples equally good. I don't know which one's right. I'm just gonna give you a flavor for the sorts of things you could do. You could ask, where's the power coming from in these LLMs? Is it neurosymbolic-ish? A lot of people have been calling for the last few years, we've gotta get the neuro stuff from AI with the symbol stuff from AI and join them together and we get more power. Do we actually have that happening here? Um, in some way. Non-neural AI, which has been the bigger part of AI from uh, 56 years, from 1956 to 2012. 2012 was when 
deep learning uh, really got announced, is about atomic symbols, and those symbols can have properties. So the symbol person can have a property of age, uh, uh, name, weight, uh, etc. Symbols represent the grounding objects in the world and their concepts and relationships, and the symbols are manipulated using rules which lead to inferences, and robotics tries to, to ground them in real life. So I took an example here from David Poole and Alan Macklett's latest edition of their textbook on artificial intelligence about symbol processing. And so on the left, top left corner, you've got some, some predicates in part of uh, and some arguments. And Kim is in R123. It happens to be a room. That's the grounding of R123. Part of R123, R123 is part of the CS building. And then there's a rule, if X is in Y and Z is part of Y, then X is in Z. And so you deduce Kim is in the CS building. And the idea is that the, robot, the robots and their perception systems relate those symbols to stuff out in the world. And that's how symbolic AI works. It gets really complicated really quick. This is a bit, a bit of stuff from the, uh, the uh, semantic web of subclasses, et cetera complicated relationships between lots and lots of symbols, enormous amounts of data, but way less than 175 billion weights, I should point out. So tokens and embeddings are sort of symbolish. Symbols have property. Token embeddings are some set of, some sort of properties. Symbols work when there's a calculus of manipulation of relationships. Embeddings have their own approximate calculus of manipulation. In those, the, those layers there, where the, 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 uh, neural, um, the neurons, the linear neurons work, they do some weird stuff. Sometimes they add those embeddings. They just add the vectors. Why does that work? Sometimes they just look in a part of the vector, the heads. And as Wolfram says, it's, it's a dark art. Um, as Subarao says, it's alchemy. We don't really know why it works, but you do this and you do that, and then it sort of works. So there's a calculus of manipulation. What is that calculus of manipulation doing? Uh, one or the other of these are subset. Is there an intersection that can be grown in some useful way? This is just one of a thousand possible set of questions you could ask. I don't know the answers to these. I'm just trying to give the idea. There's deep questions to ask. I'll talk about robotics very briefly because I mostly work on robotics. Robotics, robots are a perception system that gets some sort of semantic understanding of the world whatever semantics means, and then a little bit of reasoning, and out of that comes a force that has to be applied in the world to achieve a goal. That's all robots do. They look and they push. They push the wheels, they push an arm, squeeze the fingers, they look and they push. And they add kinetic energy to systems, and then you gotta sometimes get rid of it before it's too late. And in that, things in the world are objects. Good old-fashioned AI talked about the symbol grounding problem, which I've mentioned. And, and what does a ladder really refer to? Why, why ladder? Well, I'm working on robots that, that operate in warehouses. The worst thing a, a robot in a warehouse can do is run into a ladder. That's bad, because there's a, probably a person up there. So I'm really worried about knowing what ladders are. Some people think deep learning did the symbol grounding problem, but actually I don't think it did. It does labeling. It doesn't say perception. And, um, oops, there's a stability of, the problem of stability of grounding. So our robots wander along, there's a ladder. Oh, there's nothing there. Oh, there's a ladder. Oh, there's nothing there. It's not stable. The perception systems are not stable. You have to smooth stuff to make it work. Um, Brian Cantwell Smith did his PhD in the predecessor labs to CSAIL, and he's got a recent monograph at MIT, MIT Press that talks about this. I think the symbol grounding problem is, is deeply not understood yet, and there's a lot of work to do there. And is, the question is, are LLMs doing it with these embeddings in some interesting way? But I think the hard thing, I, I feel like as a roboticist, I should give an honest answer. The hard things in robotics are perception and action, Listening to coaching is far from sufficient to a person uh, who wants to become good at any physical skill. 
I had Ian and Greg Chappell as my cricket coaches um, uh, in, in elementary school. Best cricket players in the world. They told me what to do. I couldn't do it. Telling is not good enough. Um, Greg Chappell went on to be coach of India, so anyone from India knows Greg Chappell. Um, you have to do it in the world. You have to practice it. You have to get there and do it. Generative AI is not going to lead to better robots anytime soon. That's my one statement I'm going to make of, of what I truly believe today. Everything else, speculation. And have you noticed this hype? And some hubris? I'm going to talk about hype first. Hype is not new. Here's Frank Rosenblatt in the 50s. He had a handful of linear neurons, the diagrams I showed you before. And he didn't use digital computers to do them. He used analog computers because digital was too hard. But he had a handful of them, less than 100 weights. Here's the research trends report from Cornell in 1958. Look what it says down the bottom. Introducing the perceptron, a machine which senses, recognizes, remembers, and responds like the human mind. And it was just a handful of those linear neurons. You know, 100 weights, not 175 billion weights. So hype has been around for a long, long time around AI. And so I, I, I went, I said, uh, this next slide has not been edited. It was just me typing stream of consciousness of the hype cycles that I remember. I got involved in AI when I was in high school in the late 60s, uh, professionally uh, in the 70s, wrote a thesis, really bad master's thesis, really bad master's thesis on machine learning in 1977. So I've been around a long time and I've seen a lot of hype. There's the preemie stuff, which I didn't know about at the time, I only know about afterwards, but everything else in this thing, these are hype cycles that I remember. I remember reading about them in high school in the 60s and so on through my whole career. And some of these things come back again and again, reinforcement learning, it's on its fourth, fourth go round with AlphaGo. Uh, neural networks, we're up to volume six of neural networks. They keep coming back again and again. They go away, they come back, they go away, they come back. Revolutions in medicine. We had one in the 80s with rule-based systems um, out of Stanford. We had another one with Watson, after Watson could play Jeopardy. Oh, it's going to solve medicine. It's going to be a revolution in medicine. So we have these hype cycles all the time. Let's remember the hype. The hype is there. And where does it come from? Well, I, I, I talk about the seven deadly sins of predicting the future of AI. Uh, it was originally in my blog, and then in 2017, an edited version of it appeared in techno MIT's Technology Review. And, and these are the seven sins that I, oh, I'm, not the, I'm not the innovator, I'm not the sinner. I didn't invent these sins, I just catalog sins. So there's a difference. And, and they're not even originally cataloged all of them by me. Some of them are already been catalogued by other people in other fields of technology. But these seven sins, I think, lead to hype over predicting what's going to happen. I'm going to talk about two of them. Uh, oh, first I, I will say, I, I looked at um, both the, the salvationists who think that uh, generative AI is going to solve everything for humans and the doomsters who say it's going to kill us all. Um, and I I, I looked at what everyone was writing. I found six sins for salvationists and four sins for doomsters of those seven sins. They're commonly used. Here's one of them, exponentialism. We tend to think that everything's exponential, going to be exponential. Why do we think that? Because we just had over 50 years of Moore's law, which was exponential again and again and again. And we sort of think that everything's exponential. So when we see a graph like this, you know, it's going up. Yeah, we're right here. Wow, it's going to keep going. It's going to pass human level. Eh, maybe it's not. Maybe it's going to go like that. In fact, most things are not exponential forever because you use everything up. In the case of Moore's law, the, 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 the uh, size of the gates has got down to uh, just 20 atoms or something. And Moore's law has ended. If you read the original paper or magazine article in 1965, Moore's law was about economics, saying the gates will get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Right now, a three nanometer gate is about twice as expensive as a five nanometer gate. So Moore's law has definitely stopped. Um, 
but we tend to think, everyone thinks everything's exponential. And you hear people say, yes, look, chat GPT can, GPT 3.5 can do this, chat GPT 4 can do this, so chat GPT 5, gosh, that'll be able to be human level. Eh. Indistinguishable from magic. This is not my sin, not one that I first noticed. Um, it's noticed by Arthur C. Clarke, science fiction writer. He also, by the way, in 1945, published a paper on geosynchronous communication satellites. He thought that there'd be astronauts up there changing the vacuum tubes in those. He talked about that in his 1945 paper, so he didn't get it all right. But he has three laws, and I, I think you should look at the first law since I'm up here. Yeah. Elderly says something possible. Ah, probably impossible, probably wrong. Keep that in mind. The number two, I think, is what MIT does all the time. We go beyond the limits of the possible, eventually we'll way past them to the impossible. But number three is his third law. You know, Asimov had three laws. Arthur C. Clarke had to have three laws. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. What does that mean? Well, if you can't, uh, if you don't understand the mechanism, how do you know what the limits are? Now, I didn't know that there was going to be a poem today, but um, in Turin's paper back in 1950, he said that the computer, if, if the person asks it to write a sonnet, then the computer's going to have to obfuscate and say, ah, I was never good at poetry. Well, I asked Chat GPT 3.5 to write a sonnet in, based on Shakespeare's Sonnet 18, of what is a robot. And this is what it came out with. It just spat it out. Gets the three quatrains right, has the, it put the blank lines there, got the couplet at the end. Shall I compare thee to a robot's grace? Um, thou art more, you know, it's, it's sonnet number 18. Um, the last, second to the last line in the original was so long as man can breathe and eyes can see, made a little bit more modern language. Um, and in the, it ends in the. The third, the third uh, quatrain there talks about the eternity. It's pretty damn good. If it can do that, gosh, what can it do? It's magic. It can do anything. And that's where we sort of are. Not, but I, I look at this a little more closely. I did ask it, what is a robot? And all it said was how beautiful you are. It didn't say what is a robot. Here's, a, here's, a, here's a, a, another sonnet I like better. I think this answer's better, what, a, you know, what is a robot? Shall I compare the creatures of God? Um, you make fast maps with laser light. I, I admit the, the rhymes in the third quatrain no, the second quadrant, libraries, clumsily, eh, not so good. Doesn't have the eternity in the third one. I think, you know, ends would give life to the, it's a little better. I'm, I'm a little biased. This is one I wrote. Um, back when, when, when we first had COVID and I was locked at home. And, and I'm published. It's in, it's in, in that well-known poetry journal, IEEE Spectrum. <laughs> Eat your heart out, Mrs. Marriott. She was my English teacher in high school. She couldn't have believed this. Anyway, so I thought, okay, can ChatGPT 3.5 do better than its first attempt? So I said to it, please write another one, but this time concentrate on what defines a robot. And it did concentrate on that. Um, and it, it's, it's sort of interesting. Thou art not born of flesh nor earthly sin, yet in form a certain beauty lies. Um, the limbs not made of sinno bone or skin, but gears and servos in precision move. You know, it talks about what is a robot, but it's lost, I think, it's lost Sonnet 18 from um, Shakespeare. Shell is about all that's left in, uh, of it. So it has limits, but we, we don't know how it works. We can't say how it works. We don't have an intuition. So we don't know what its limits are, and it becomes magic. Why do we do that with AI? I think it's because AI is about intelligence and language. Intelligence, you know, that's what, that's what got us here to MIT. I'm smarter than the other people. Intelligence, I got intelligence. Um, language is what makes us people. And so we, we like to think about um, 
When we see AI trying to do intelligence and trying to do language, we think about ourselves and it's a reflection on ourselves. But there's also hubris, where people believe the hype, maybe the same people who generate the hype, and say they think it's gonna make it happen. Let me give you an example of that. Oh, no, so, sorry, the hype leads to hubris, and then the hubris leads to conceit, and the conceits lead to failure. So, autonomous vehicles. And this is sort of another, speed, another of the sins, speed of deployment. I was at a talk in Santa, uh, in Santa Cruz, 1987, when Ernst Dickmans talked about his vehicle that had driven along the autobahns amongst public traffic at uh, about 70 kilometers an hour for 20 kilometers, just driving along with, with the other people back in 1987. By 1995, Takeo Tanade's students, Dean Pomelo and uh, Todd Yoakum, had this vehicle, which would hands off the wheels, feet off the pedals, drove from Pittsburgh, most of the way it drove with that condition, from Pittsburgh to Los Angeles in a, a project they called No Hands Across America. And then in 2007, the D DARPA Urban Challenge, which was run by Sebastian Thrun, then at Stanford, had, and MIT competed in this, had vehicles um, driving around in traffic. And so people thought, wow, this is doable. That's the, the, the hubris. We can make this happen. And uh, Sebastian went on to help co-found uh, Google X. And in 2012, I first went in a Google X car on a freeway in California. It worked. Um, and everyone thought it was just going to happen like magic. The conceit was that, for, that there's going to be a one-to-one -one replacement for human drivers. So we didn't have to do anything about infrastructure. We didn't have to change anything. Just the cars were going to change, and they're going to drive amongst the humans. And this is a, a screen grab I, I took in 2017. I've colored it in a little bit. Uh, it's still on that page, if you go to the, that page ID, um, where executives of companies were saying when they were going to have level four full self-driving and have it deployed. The, Dates in parentheses at the end are when they made these predictions. The dates in blue are when they said it would happen. And I've pinked out the ones that have passed. None of them happened. Um, there's a few blue ones later. The orange arrows are where I since heard the executives change their predictions and say it was going to take longer. So, for instance, fourth one from the bottom, Daimler chairman in 2014 said they'd have fully autonomous vehicles by 2025. A few years later, they said, nah, we're not going to do it. Other people have pushed out their dates. There would be one from Tesla, which gets pushed out a year, every year, has since 2014. Um, and they're not deployed at scale. Uh, uh, this is the cruise vehicles. This, these happen to be in Austin. Um, there have been a lot, there were 300 of them in uh, San Francisco this year. I've, I've taken autonomous cruise rides 36 times this year. 35 times, I didn't fear for my life. One time I did. Um, and I don't know if you know, the weekend before last, there was more than one CEO in trouble. Um, Kyle Voigt uh, resigned as CEO of, of Cruise, and Cruise has currently shut down all operations, even with drivers. So things haven't gone as well for GM as they thought. And there was this one-for-one -one replacement became in, in inevitable. So every company thought they had to get in on the action. It was a big, big prize. And a lot of VC money went to many startups. It was such a big prize. So what are VCs supposed to do? Supposed to invest in things which have high return. This looked like high return. Um, it became a monoculture of learning-based methods. And there was a massive duplication of collecting non-public data sets. The amount of driving around just to collect data sets that was amazing. Billions of dollars have been spent on it. And what happened badly, I think, was it killed the idea of government-led or funded digitalizations of our roads. Every time we've introduced some, some change of transportation, we've changed our infrastructure. We, we, you know, um, Ford, uh, Henry Ford, built roads so that his cars could move around, not just in rutted mud. Um, and digitalization of roads, back in the 90s, there were, there were there were projects, uh, Citrus at Berkeley, of how we could collect data from 
fixed assets on the roads and transmit them to cars and make them be able to self-drive safely. That all went away because of this conceit that we could just do one-for-one -one replacement. So it slowed down safety innovations, and there was a lot of stifling of innovation. Why did so many people get it so wrong that, you know, we're going to have self-driving cars a few years ago, which we don't have? First is fear of missing out. They didn't want to miss out. It was such a big idea, they couldn't miss out. And the other one, this is one I, um, in the FABO, I put it at um, Fear of being a wimpy techno-pessimist and looking stupid later. <laughs> and so what scares me about generative AI is researchers jump to the shiny new thing where they were almost there with what they were working on before, and they abandon it. And then the other thing is that, and Ada Lovelace talked about this in 1840, note G of her paper in 1840. Concentrate on the new applications, you get sucked in by the hubris, believing the conceits, you think it's gonna happen quickly. When it doesn't happen quickly, you say, it's over, and you walk away. Whereas if you just stayed a little longer, you would have something. Ada Lovelace was trying to get the British government to fund the, the uh, analytical engine at the time. So she's suffered from that along with Babbage. And in industry, I worry about VC funding swarms to high margin, because VCs should be, you know, high margin is where they get great return on their investments, so this is natural behavior they should do. And I'm worried that they'll neglect connecting to the real world more than they should. So a whole generation of engineers will forget about, it, forget about other forms of software and AI. That's my, my scary things about generative AI. So my message is with the grad generative AI, whether you're an explorer or an exploiter, examine your motivations and fears, fear of missing out, or fear of being a wimpy techno-pessimist and looking stupid later. By the way, that's precisely the argument French mathematician Pascal, Blaise Pascal, had why you should believe in God. Because what if you didn't believe in God and you show up, <laughs> God's there, how was it? Did you believe in me? <laughs> it's really embarrassing. So it's hard not to, not to suffer from that sin. What's the conceit of generative AI? The conceit is that it's somehow gonna lead to, to uh, artificial general intelligence. By itself, it's not. There's some other stuff that needs to get in there. That's the conceit. A lot of people talk about that conceit. Don't believe it. Don't get involved in the hubris. Forget about the hubris. Work hard, whether it be in generative AI, whether it be in exploration or exploitation, Expect to have to work hard, and something good will come out of it. Thank you. Microphones or yeah, I, I, I didn't want to try and go to all the varieties, so I was just giving a general theme talk. Um, so, yes, uh, and there are specific dangers around that. Um, um, I, I know that people are talking about it. Where AI has been successful usually has involved a person in the loop, a person to cut out the chaff. It happens with Google search. You know, back, back before Google got taken over by ads, it would put out, a, you know, 10 things, and maybe the third one was the one you needed, or the fourth one, and you needed a human. So anything with large design models is gonna, I think, involve people for a while. But as I said, I'm not even in this field. I'm just an outside observer. So. The particular details I can't help. Yes. Well, there's two there's two versions of maths. There's arithmetic and there's theorem proving. And there's a lot of papers coming out in, in, the, uh, in the archive um, from mathematicians um, talking about how it doesn't help people 
understand intuitively what is going on. And mathematics is a very intuitive sort of thing. Um, so I think the mathematics is distinct from arithmetic. Um, there's also a whole set of papers about that. I, I, I think that, you know, it's, it's like, it's like um, when Kasparov was beaten by Deep Blue in the 90s, people said that's the end of chess. Well, no, it hasn't been the end of chess. And in fact, Kasparov has built this whole uh, thing about humans and, and chess engines working together. So I think there's some possibilities there. Uh, doomsters and salvationists thinking the rapture is about to come both overestimate the short term. Um, so, you know, we're going to solve mathematics and the mathematicians, no, no, that's us. We can't do that. I think this, just calm down a little bit, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, so, 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 so perhaps generative AI can help with some things, but don't forget the basics of it. You know, the, 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 there's the basics of energy. There's some basic equations about energy. There's, there's, it, it, it doesn't get solved just by having a better generative AI system. It doesn't solve all the problems. There's gonna be a large class of problems. No one technology has ever surpassed everything else. Um, writing didn't surpass everything else. Reading, writing didn't surpass everything else. So, so take it easy. There's gonna be a lot of stuff. I, I had a very famous technologist um, uh, come to me two years ago. She said her son was just about to graduate from a well-known university in mechanical engineering. My God, what's he gonna do with his life as a mechanical engineer? It's all over. Well, well there's plenty of jobs for mechanical engineers. Thank you, Rob. Let's thank Rob once again. We're going to take a 10-minute break.